So uh, for those that are new, let, let me just give you a, a, a quick introduction, if you like. Um, so this series, which is season two now with Make Space in Cambridge, was started basically with something to do um, in COVID, really. But yeah, it has proved quite popular since we're here for season two. And in, in this second series, um, these are all subjects we're talking about. These are all subjects being suggested to me by you or sort of thing you'd, you'd like, to, uh, like to hear something about. Uh, we can never go into these subjects in a huge amount of detail. You know, even a three year degree wouldn't do these sub individual subjects justice. So they're just little snapshots of things that might be useful to you. And I've been doing electronics now for what, 27, 28 years. So these are the things which I find useful. Um, you know, it's not about getting into lots of horrible derivation. We don't want to be doing that. Um, so, you know, if, if, you, if you're keen on the derivation, um, I'll, I'll probably steer you towards a, uh, a, a heavy duty textbook somewhere. Um, but, you know, it is life, so it can go horribly wrong. Uh, the most common thing that tends to go wrong is we tend to lose picture quality. So if, if anyone notices the picture quality go all to pots, please say, because from my end, it all looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, right, okay, so um, it's about an hour or so. You're very welcome to all stick your microphones on. Um, you're very welcome to interrupt me and ask any questions or share any thoughts, but try and keep the pace if I can. And uh, yeah, so I've got a few experiments um, for us to tinker with today. So hopefully we can have a look at some real world filters and what you get for your money. So also, just in case things go a bit pear shaped, or if you would like to download any of these, um, I've got here, this is one of my, my favorite little pages. So if you take yourself off to siliconcortex.uk website and scroll down to downloads, the slides I've got here on paper, you can just download them. Uh, if you go to downloads, you'll see there's a how to design electronics folder. And you'll see season one, which was the last season, and you'll see season four, season two rather, um, which is uh, this season, as it were. And I you know, say four because this is, the, this is our fourth outing. So it's already uploaded. Grab it whenever you want to. You don't have to take copious notes. Just sit back with a cup of tea and enjoy it. Right, so without further ado, let's have a look and remind ourselves on what does a filter actually do? And uh, it is a massive subject, this. Um, so we're barely going to get to scratch the surface of it. But in a nutshell, a filter is a small circuit can be very simple, which we'll have a play with in just a moment, which just cuts out some of the frequencies. Um, so this is a typical way you'd represent it. You'd have an amplitude, it could be a voltage, of course, and the frequency. And then at some frequency, and we'll work this out in just a moment, the voltage will start to drop off. Now, in an ideal world, the filter would probably look something like kabam and just 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 drop off and cut off any any frequencies which you didn't want that doesn't happen in the real world and it's absolutely impossible to get to it you can get close to it but it's not usually worth the effort so in a nutshell that's just what it does and usually we'll pick a we'll work out at what point there'll be what's called a cutoff frequency and we usually represent that as F naught, as you'll see. And we've got to work out at some point uh, where do things start to cut off in our filter. And usually what you'll find when we have a look at this, if you read around, you'll hear about something called a minus 3 dB point. You'll, you'll see that if you look around. What that means is minus 3 dB point for any filter, it's the point at which the power in the system is halved. 
So it's not the point at which the voltage is halved. We're talking about energy power. And it turns out if the power is a half, it usually works out at about 69, 70% of the voltage is still there. So they're just a couple of little parameters um, for us to bear in mind. So I've got here just so we can remind ourselves just a few of the standard filters um, and of what they do. So a low pass filter, top left here, lets the low frequencies pass, includes in the title. High pass filter just lets the high frequencies pass. We'll have a look at some simple circuits for these in just a moment. And then a band pass is um, letting some of the frequencies pass. And uh, it's not too much of a surprise what a, what a band stop is. So those are your, your, your basic filters. And you can probably do just about anything and everything once you've got a very simple circuit and a set of equations just to help you. And for those of a certain age, I found this lovely picture. I don't know if anyone remembers ghetto blasters. <laughs> any, any kids of the 80s here? I'm one. Yeah. So if you remember on your ghetto blaster, you know, with, with, with your twin cassette deck, if you had enough money, you had a little something on there called a graphic equalizer. All this was was just a whole bunch of filters, and you could just adjust how much of that particular frequency you would want to get through. So these might just be. I know we'll just draw them down here. Why not? Hey, just to help us. So you know, so this this first one here might might be for a set of frequencies here, and then the next one along would be a different set of frequencies. I could have gone on the same one, really, couldn't I? Why not? So that's all. When you had your graphic equalizer, that's all it was. It was just a fancy name for. Well, in this case, just five filters. And of course, these are just in the audio range of what about 500, one kilohertz up to maybe five, 10 kilohertz. And all you did with these little dials here is just how much of the, that frequency you're going to let through your, your filter. So obviously, you know, you used to wind the bass right up, didn't you? Just to uh, get, get crank out some, some good 80s sound. So very simple there. Right, so hopefully that sets the scene for what a filter does. So I've got some very simple equations here that we can have a little look at and I've built a board. So I'm hoping we'll be able to make some experiments work. So the first thing we're gonna look at is something called a passive filter. We're gonna look at something shortly called an active filter. When you hear the words passive, it just means it's made out of resistors and capacitors and some things called inductors, which we'll have a look at in a moment as well. So for a low pass filter, and this is the most common one you'll use by far in just about everything you do, I would have thought. Um, it's a simple resistor and a capacitor. There's a very simple equation which governs it. And this is two times pi, pi being 3.14. And the value of whatever your resistor is in ohms and your capacitor, whatever it is in farads. And then that'll just give you the cutoff frequency, which if you remember is minus three dB, or we could call it, we put there, we'll put 70% of V naught or the maximum voltage. So this here is V naught. Yup. That's all you need, really. So as you can probably guess, if your resistor goes up, your capacitor has to go down for the same frequency. And usually what I do is I usually try and start with a capacitor. Uh, well, it depends on how high a frequency I'm working. But usually I'll try and make my capacitor somewhere in the region of one nanofarad to one microfarad. 
And if I can, I'll try and make my resistor somewhere in the order. I'm just guessing here, somewhere in the order, maybe about one kilo ohm. Maybe, maybe up to something like sort of certainly less than 100 kilo ohms. Shooting there from the hip slightly. So usually they're the sort of ranges which I'll, I'll be looking at. And it would also be using ceramic capacitors. There are different types of capacitors. Uh, you know, and if you may have heard of electrolytic capacitors, um, they're the, usually, I've got one here actually, it's a shame. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, something like electrolytic capacitor, electrolytic capacitor is not great for doing filtering because they're very leaky. So if this value here, the RC seems to be quite high, then I'll probably try and adjust the, the resistor and the capacitor value. It's just having a bit of a play in, until it works. That's all you have to do. So that's called a low pass filter. And we'll have a tinker with them in just a moment. Hopefully that'll work. It's, it's, it's brother, of course, or sister, depending on your point of view, is just a, it's just it's a high pass filter. And you can see all we've done, we've just swapped the resistor and the capacitor around and it just works the other way. And would you believe it? The equation is exactly the same. It's not a mistake. It's exactly the same. It doesn't change. So it's dead easy to swap between the two. Right, okay, simple, simples. And then there's another one here, which we'll have a look at a bit more detail in just a second, the band stop filter. So here you can see we've actually introduced a whole new component, which is an inductor here. And a very simple equation. We're not gonna get into how you derive these equations because uh, we'll get into complex notation, square root of minus one. But if you just wanna have an idea of what on earth is going on to get a feel, so this is gonna do what I want roughly. The impedance of an inductor, impedance being its resistance, is proportional to the inductor value. We'll do the ZF there. Which is to say that as the, as the frequency increases, you'll find the resistance or the impedance is the technical term of the inductor increases as well. So they're very good at letting DC through, but if you had a high frequency, high frequency, the, um, what I should say, that's a proportional to the frequency. There we go, better way of doing it. So as the uh, frequency goes up, so does the impedance of a uh, inductor. And for a capacitor, uh, Z, C, uh, F rather, for a capacitor, it's exactly the opposite. As the frequency goes up, the resistance of it goes down. So just going back to our filter here, just uh, so you can see, okay, which way around is it? <clears throat> so this is letting, so as high, as high frequencies approach this, this will start to have a very small resistance. Yeah, not proportional, I should say. So high frequencies will get through this filter very easily. With our original one, of course, which I can't find now. Um, that's underneath, that's why. With our, with our other uh, low pass filter, that's the proportional one over, over C. As the frequency increases, then this resistance drops, which means it'll start to um, cause the output to drop. And that's why we end up with this, this curve here. So you've got the, you've got the inductor trying to do that. And you've got the capacitor trying to do that. And so between them, you know, you'll, you'll get this uh, band stop effect. Right, I reckon we could do a few simple experiments if- uh, Stephen? If, yeah. Um, can you just return the band stop one? Yeah, certainly. Oh, hang on. Here we go, here we go, here we go. So um, in, in your picture, I mean, I, I, and I'm not complaining, I'm just asking, 
your the shape of the filter, uh, sorry, the shape of the curve yeah. is not symmetrical um, for for each side. So it start the, the curve as it starts to drop off is much sharper than the curve as it's getting close to being zero. Um, yeah, well, well, that depends on whether you're looking at it. Yeah, yes. Um, if you're to me. So it, did you intend that to be the case? And, and if so, why? No, I didn't. Why intend, does that? Right, I didn't intend that to be the case. Oh, um, yeah. okay. However, uh, it's, it's a really good point, actually, Ruth. And just, just to extrapolate that on very, on very slightly, when, when you look at the, in the frequency domain, if you look at it uh, as a, logarith a logarithmic scale, uh, you do tend to see things being a little bit more um, symmetric. If you look at it in a linear, then, then things start to look absolutely terrible. I'm not sure if that will <laughs> <laughs> confuse things for people or not. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just I will just say um, before you move on, um, you you did say one thing which really opened my eyes just now. Oh dear. So, okay. Which was that if you just put a, an R instead of the L and C, what you've got there is a voltage divider. That's exactly what you have. Absolutely. If you but... if you then consider the L and the C to be resistances, albeit with weird characteristics. Exactly you right. can then see why they're doing what they're doing, because yeah. they're voltage dividing in a frequency dependent way. That's exactly what's happening. Absolutely. And, and I hadn't really understood that before. So well done. All oh, right. OK, right. Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> Great. If anyone's got any questions as, as we go on, by all means, stop me. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just wrap it to the end of days. So, um, yeah. OK. Yeah, that's, it's a really very, a very, very good point. And um, um, for, for, for those, just to complete the story here, what I often do, Ruth, if you could draw a, any filter as, as a resistor, I mean, this is our RC, so that ZR equals uh, R. Okay, that's very simple. And for our capacitor, uh, well, ZC equals one over omega, uh, omega C or, or two pi. F. So you could, you can act, of, of course, usually um, the, you start getting into complex notation as well, which we'll, we'll touch on very shortly. So you, you can actually, it is actually a potential divider, just as you say, Ruth. And if so you could actually start to calculate your network, if you like, of your RC or L. Or I'm trying to work everything out using, you know, if uh, sort of got a degree online here, um, seven in theorems, you can start to apply all those sorts of things, which I haven't done in 30 years. <laughs> all right, okay, should we, should we um, move on? Because uh, I've got a, a little experiment here, which, which might help, um, helps a little bit before we, we look at a couple of issues with passive filters and how we can solve them. So fingers crossed, I am going to go to uh, desk cam. Right, hopefully it's, uh, I think it's this one, is this desk cam? Is that working for anybody? Silence. Right, okay. Can I turn that's that good. On? Good, that's good. Right, so um, I'm going to, Right, so, oh, actually, let me just, um, just swap here to uh, the back to this camera here to show you what we've got, and then we'll swap to desk cam. So what I've done here, just to try and elaborate a little bit to help us, there we go, hopefully that will go a bit brighter for you all. So I've made a little circuit here that's got some passive filters on, and, uh, and I've got one here that's actually going to look at this next called an active filter, which is a, a tiny bit more sophisticated but uh, extremely useful for my favorite filter. If you can have a favorite filter that is. So I've got here, I've got here, uh, so this is my- Stephen, Yeah. Um, before you carry on, your, your current camera, uh, well, at least for me, is showing all of those things as being slightly blurry blobs. Fantastic. <laughs> we love a blurry blob, right. <laughs> um, <coughs> oh, hang on, the camera's about to fall over. 
Right, let's see if I can do something to unblurry. Um, I can see it fairly clearly. There we go. There we go. That, that is better. That's better, huh? Yeah, it's the best best camera I could find for the money. Right, so all I've got here is our little test board, which we'll have a tinker with, and then I'll move to desk cam when it'll point at the oscilloscope for us. So RRC, so this is my, my resistor and, and capacitor tiny networks I've got. So I've just built a few of them here, and I've got one some at the bottom with inductors on, and then I've just got some inputs down here on the left and the corresponding outputs on the right. And then we'll then have a look on the oscilloscope and just have a look at the uh, <clears throat> what you really get for your money, which is uh, <clears throat> not quite what you think. So if I can swap to the desk cam, as I call it, there we go, and I'll move it round to there. There we go, you can all see desk cam. So on the bottom, so on the bottom here, I've got my signal generator, and then which is then sort of going to the input of that circuit we just saw. Which I wonder if I can might be able to do something really clever here. Will this let me? Okay, something's ticking here unpleasantly. All right. Okay. So. Right. Um, right, don't ask me what's happened to desk cam here, cameras here. Uh, right, let's just get rid of that. Right, bear with us, it's all gone a bit wonky. Um, does that go back to normal? Okay, that's fine. Right. Okay, one of my features hasn't been playing properly, but doesn't matter. Right, okay, back to desk cam for a moment. So what I've just set up here for us all here is, this is a signal generator. So my, my RC filter I've set to around about 13 to 20 kilohertz. And then on the top here, this is the output. So what I can do here, I think if I go down frequencies, it'll probably get a little bit bigger. You can see there, yep. And we can just adjust our levels here. So if you can all see that, okay. Definitely silence. I'll see if that's a yes. And if we just wind up our frequencies, we can start to see very quickly the dropping. So yeah, I think just as Ruth says here, it's it's all it's almost very non-linear in in how it filters. Hope you can see that. So we can just zoom in there a little bit. There you go. So you can just see if I just get that. There you go. So hopefully you can see that for OK. Not much of an amplitude. And then as we wind up or wind down the frequencies, that's 300 kilohertz or it's 140K, you can see there. Then we've got 13 kilohertz, which is roughly where I designed the filter to be for that minus 3 dB point. And then uh, as we go to 1.3 kilohertz, we can see suddenly things start to look pretty, pretty steady. That's um, 133 hertz. And that's just 13 hertz. So a brick wall filter doesn't exist. There's always, always going to be some trade-off is the moral of the story. And I do have here, I think if we go to this bottom one, which is the band pass filter, band, I think it's the band stop filter, I think this one here. So fingers crossed this works. So this is the resistor, inductor, and the capacitor. So at a low frequency, things are pretty steady. Then suddenly here, uh, well, about 300 hertz, this is 300 hertz here. Things have dropped off quite dramatically on my filter. 133 hertz. Then it's really dropped off completely. Then suddenly uh, it's dropped off. It's still quite dropped off. That's 13 kilohertz. 
And then fingers crossed, if I go back, things start to then pick up again. There we go, we can start to see. Things start becoming normal again. But I'm pretty sure that whilst the, we'll go back to um, desk cam here. There's always trade-offs when you, when you have these things. Okay, so back to desk cam. Okay, that's gone well, isn't it? Right. Okay. Right. Um, right. You've got a black screen, everybody. Someone? Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it that your um, your contrast and brightness controls? No, no it's, it's worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> One moment, callers. <laughs> Wretched technology. Right. I might have to just reset the uh, IP vote. There you go. This is technology for you, huh? Right. Let me just follow follow this. No, follow this one. Right. So, um, right. We might have to ha have a brief interlude. Right. That's one camera over there. I can still see you all. There we go. Panic over. Right. So, uh, what was I going to say now? Yes. What I was going to say was in that filter circuit, one thing which I have noticed uh, in these doing these filter circuits. Uh, let's get rid of that. Uh, right. Yeah. So, one thing which I have noticed is the roll off. Oh, not the roll off. The size of this bowl, if you like, is very much dependent on the value of this resistor over here, for sure. Uh, maybe I can just de blur that for you slightly. Just refocus. There you go. Yeah, so uh, the value of this resistor here does affect. Um, the, the shape, it won't affect the cutoff frequency on a band, band stop or band pass. So, but it will affect, you know, how how much of a, a the, the shape of that dip is very much affected by the, the value of this resistor. Uh, on the signal generator here, it's it's locked at 50 ohms. So there's not a not, lot not I can do about that. Now it isn't all peaches and cream, unfortunately with these things, because in this very simple example here, I've done a table of different frequencies and uh, what the values of the resistors and the capacitors would be. And the issue here, you can see in red, that as you start to go to super low frequencies, the values of your capacitors start to become quite ridiculous. When there's no way you're going to get a two and a half thousand Henry capacitor, that, that's frankly not a thing. And conversely, if you go to look very high frequencies, the capacitors, I mean, here we are 100 megahertz for a low pass. And, and you can already see the capacitor is down at a few, few tens of um, picofarads. So the question is, how do you solve that problem? And how you solve that problem is with my favorite filter in the world. You can have a favorite filter, which is called a Salon key filter. Now this is absolutely brilliant. This this little this little filter here, it's it's a very generic design. So you, you'll see this everywhere. It's got two identical capacitors, and it's got two identical resistors, <coughs> and it's got a feedback here of R1 and R2. And all you have to do is they all come with an absolute cheat sheet where the gain, which is R1, R2, the two resistors, is just, um, they give you that. So you just got to make sure the gain, which is governed by a very simple equation, depending on with what sort of filter you want, we'll talk about this in just a second, depending on what sort of filter you want, determines what gain you want. Someone's worked this out, you don't have to worry about it. You just follow the rules. <coughs> And then depending on what filter you want, then you'll just have a very simple equation again. And depending on what type you want, we'll talk about these three types in just a second. 
depends on what value you make alpha. And as long as you don't deviate or hesitate from these equations, I guarantee it'll work every single time. It, it is an absolute thing of beauty. Now, the difference between the Butterworth, the Bezel, and the Chebyshev is, is the question. So, <clears throat> what you have with those graphs, with a, we'll draw on the back here. Right. <clears throat> with a Butterworth filter, you'll get a nice roll off. It's brilliant. We'll do, we'll do a Butterworth. With a bezel filter, you'll get a slightly different roll off, usually not quite so good. And then with a, a Chevy Chev filter, you get something called a bit of ripple, but then things start to roll off really quite well. So there's always, always a trade off. So if you were designing a audio filter, I would recommend you go for something like a bezel filter. The reason you want to go for a bezel filter is because these resistors, uh, these capacitor components will start to cause a phase shift or time delays at, for different frequencies of the filter. So just for example, I could go on the back of this one here. So if you had a, a signal coming into your, your filter circuit, uh, what you might find, and I have another filter signal coming into my filter, the output will actually be slight, slight, slightly phase shifted. So in an audio system, that might start to sound like a, a little bit of distortion in your filtering. It's just a phenomena of the components. And depending on what filter you have will affect this distortion in the output. So for an audio, definitely go for a bezel filter. But if you're just using something just to pick off signals and you're not bothered about that, you could go for a, a Butterworth filter because it has a much better roll off, much better than an RC capacitor. Or if you want a really good roll off, I would go for something like a Chevy Chev. So that has, that's got a really nice shot, but there's a trade-off that you'll start in your passband, you'll start to get things are slightly non-linear in the output. So the frequencies will start to go a little bit funny on you. But the other beauty of a Salon key filter is there's no inductors. And that's one of the big wins for an, any active filter. You only have capacitors, you only have resistors. So whereas before was working out a 2,500 Henry inductor, there are no inductors. So it makes it much easier now to design your circuit. You've only got to worry about capacitor values. So um, it's a big win in my book. And uh, I'll, I'll often use this circuit and more often than not, I tend to use the Chevy Chev. Right. Adrian, yeah. One of the things that I'm aware of is that if you cut your frequencies too quickly, so Chevy Chev versus Butterworth, yeah. um, then you, you can end up with aliasing where some of the sig some of the much higher frequencies end up folded back into the the pass range yeah is that some is that only a feature of digital filters or is that also true of no i knew someone's going to ask me about nyquist so um it, it is a feature of digital filters um for those who don't know what the nyquist is it's it's by some fellow called nyquist where when you're sampling a frequency uh using like an analog to digital like you might say on an arduino uno board for example you need to make sure that your sampling frequency is at least twice the frequency that um, you want to measure. Otherwise, you will definitely end up with, with aliasing in, in your design. 
So I'm not aware of it in analog. I've never come across it in analog. If, if okay. someone's got any experience, please pipe up. But it, it is, in my experience, the, the preserve of digital. Okay. Which, so uh, we're not the, doing the, it here today. <laughs> just, just to to re uh, to to emphasize that Nyquist limit is a limit, not an ideal. Correct. And, yeah. Um, if you're, um, uh, so if if you set your your sampling frequency to too close to what you're actually wanting, you will end up with this aliasing effect which can yeah. be really destructive, you know, it can really mess up things. Yeah. Um, and so that's why you want to, as it's called in digital world, oversample, i.e. Yeah. have a sampling frequency significantly higher than Nyquist, mm -hmm. is, so that you don't end up with destructive aliasing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I'll, I'll stop there because that's digital. <laughs> I, yeah. I was just wondering if it was also an analog thing, but uh, no. In fact, the, the issue you'll probably run into in analog uh, for everybody here is if we're using just the say the um, where is it now? Here we go. Go back to here with the an with the analog filtering. Um, the, the, the problem you're probably going to run into is when you want to. When you want to just do very low frequencies, which you'd think should be very simple to do, and very high frequencies, which, well, you know, high frequencies are always going to probably be a problem. But very low frequencies, it's, um, you know, the, the, comp the values of the components, whilst on a piece of paper, they may look great. Uh, in reality, where on earth are you going to get a decent capacitor of, of a thousand microfarads? You know, you're then looking at sort of, uh, you know, electrolytic tantalums, and I certainly wouldn't be using either of those sorts of filters for a, um, uh, or components rather, for a, a filter. So there's that problem. Now, of course, we just mentioned that issue you can solve by going to a um, active filter where there are no inductors. So that's one problem solved. However, don't forget that a although, although the gain of this um, is somewhere in the order of what well, was less than two, wasn't it? Something like one point eight, I think, roughly was the gain. I was just looking for. You don't don't forget that these filled the, these op amps themselves are are have had limits, so you'd have to choose your component very carefully. Because um, I think it was if I could draw it correctly how the frequency and the gain for an op amp uh, I think will eventually just roll off until you get unity gain. Um, it's usually quite a high frequency. You know, you'll probably find you know, that'll be the open gain. You know, so you know you, you might you might be up at the maybe you know the 100 megahertz perhaps before you get to a unity gain on a op amp which of course would completely ruin any of your filtering. So there's, there's always limitations, nothing's for free. Now there's something else uh, which, um, I've got this here actually, because I'll mention this, I have no shares, shares in this book, but uh, if you do have Horowitz and Is, uh, I'll put the bookmark in here, and um, there is a fantastic section on page 408, um, all on these filters. It says here my internet's unstable, so um, I'll have to keep an eye on that, and hopefully we won't lose it. All right, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, so th there are, they give you a table of all these values, and they give you different graphs and explain quite a lot, so... Uh, if you want to know more about how to design these these filters, then I fully encourage to um, you know, skip off into Cambridge or any other bookshop or Amazon and um, treat yourself to a a copy of Horowitz and Hill. Everything's in here and it's beautifully explained as well. They've done a cracking job. This is the third edition now. I had the second edition when I was at university all those years ago. 
so yeah, so I just wanted to uh, say that there's there's a ton more stuff, and you can always dig around on the internet, which is what that was there just to remind me of. Right, okay, let me, what are we doing for time? We're doing all right. Right, so something that I now I want to share with, it's just the last thing on my list here today for us, is uh, we'll go back to the circuit in a second, and uh, hopefully the camera won't mess up. Obviously, one of the issues which we're going to have with filtering is the signal's going to go negative. Um, because a lot of this series is focused around applying these circuits to things like the Arduino Uno, you know, you know ARM cores, or, or even, you know, the Raspberry Pi or any of the others. What you can't do is go and sort of shove a negative voltage into your circuit that's going to do it a power of no good. So what you're going to have to do is find some way to offset the signal. And, and that's what this circuit here does. So it's just a very simple DC offset. Uh, where I've just got two resistors, a potential divider. So I have my signal coming in here. Just go back to the circuit and find it. It's lying on the floor. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Here we go. So there we go. So <clears throat> if we have a signal coming into our, let's do it in a different color. The signal coming into our op amp here. Yep. So you can see that. Okay. Obviously, we're going to get an output here. But these are all going to be referenced around the zero volts. And if we've got ourselves, you know, any microcontroller with on the ADC, we definitely do not want to apply that directly into our chip unless the chip is specified it can handle a negative voltage. Um, it'll, it'll probably have a negative experience. So the way to deal with that is, oh, is just, just lift it. So this is just a, this, this is just an uh, instrumentational amplifier. So it's, this just will sum two voltages together. So this is uh, V, we'll call it VOS for V offset. So the output here is let's say this is V from our Salon key. And so the output here will just be VSK plus V whatever offset that we set it to be. So most of these chips hover around, you know, uh, well, they'll probably what, 3.3 volts, something like that. Five volts, I think you can on the Arduino Uno, the ABR chips, the microchip. So I'll just probably just set that bias point there. It's just a potential divider. Maybe make that something like, say, 1.7 volts if you're using ARM, or maybe 2.5 volts if you're using a microchip. AVR chip, if you can see that, okay. <clears throat> so yeah, so just a, a top tip there. Um, I think really terribly amazing. And uh, yeah, so it's it just to remind you for your AVR chips, um, you've got a boatload of analog, you can then apply those two. So you've got your six there, you can tinker with. And then once you've into your AVR chip, uh, or whatever the other one I've got here, just to, so we're not, sure we're not biased. <clears throat> uh, you've got a number of analog pins, uh, you know, if you've got something of like uh, ARM Cortex, um, I don't know which one this is, M something or other, M4 probably. So yeah, so you just, just offset and then you can easily do any of the maths that you fancy. Uh, piece of cake. Right, okay, um, wowzers, that's what I wanted to share with you. I mean, there's so much more to talk around with uh, filters, but if anyone's got any questions, you want me to go over anything again, um, please, please say. We've all gone very quiet. Okay. On the offset, yeah. You obviously used uh, your your experience to choose a 
nice packaged uh, uh, amplifier. Yeah. Uh, you now I'm I don't know the inner one two eight, but presumably you can do all sorts of other things with it. Oh my goodness, can you ever? Yes. Uh, well, this particular one. Uh, well, this is one which uh, I know will work. <laughs> Okay, so so there's there's the first port of call. <laughs> uh, I mean, this particular one. Uh, I mean, you you, uh, you can actually put if you want. You can actually put a resistor in this in this circuit, and and you can actually apply a gain to it if you want to RG for gain. So there, there are all sorts of things that you could do. You don't necessarily have to do it this way if you didn't want to. Um, you know, some some of these other op amps. If you go and have a look at them. Uh, we'll have a a small a small offset pin on some of them. So uh, I mean, you could probably do the same thing with some transistors. You could probably lift it. Um, how do you do it? If you if we go back to transistors from way back when, um, if I can get this right with the transistor circuit, here's the transistor circuit. So here's our input here. This is our V in. So um, don't ask me what values we would work out for all of these. I couldn't tell you the top of my head. So you, there we go. So you could use a transistor circuit. Um, this would certainly lift the voltage, um, you know, ab above zero volts. That would work. You could do it that way. The, the direction I, I was going, because you, you you could do it with a common or garden uh, operational amplifier in a non-inverting summing mode. Yeah. Uh, but I just wondered, has the world progressed on to uh, encapsulated uh, filter ICs? Uh, has it what? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I was just wondering whether you could... Uh, uh, is there an IC that you could effectively has all of the filter components in it for you? Oh, right. Um, usually the closest I have found to this, right, it's very good. Well, two parts to your answer. First of all, um, you mentioned a summing amplifier and uh, if anyone wants to go back and actually look through the downloads from season one, there's a section on op amps, and I think you'll actually find this might be a summing op amp um, in there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, all this device here, this is just two summing op amps inside. That's, that's all it actually is. So that's the first part of your answer. Um, you could use the ordinary summing op amp. Um, the resistors around the summing op amp are actually already in. Uh, they've yeah. already been integrated into here to solve that for you. Regards, is are there chips where um, chips where these these are all done for you? Yes, well, yes and no. There are some. The only one I've actually come across um, is from Cypress Semiconductors, and I'm not even sure you can buy it anymore. Where they they've put a a number of some of, of op amps and you can just attach your own external resistors and capacitors so that they usually they've done some of the work for you but not all of it mm -hmm. so that they'll go so far to try and make it as versatile as possible a chip where everything's in there for you um no that, that doesn't really really tend to exist to be honest with you i've, I've certainly not come across it just wondered how the world had moved on. <laughs> uh, no, is the answer to your question. The world has not moved on. <laughs> well, and in fact, I think as well, on, on that note, um, certainly, you know, um, Self and Ruth were talking about uh, Ruth's circuit, uh, must be over a year ago now, and we, we kind of parked it, didn't we, Ruth, because uh, we couldn't buy the chips. Yes, indeed. Yeah, now, the, now what is now available, and, and this partly answers the other question, is off-the-shelf generic chips are still very much available and probably in good volume and will certainly weather this um, 
supply chain storm of um, can't buy anything. Uh, so I, I, I would encourage not to use any chips that are extremely specialist. Um, as I've mentioned before to many people, you've got to think like a 1980s engineer. You know, <laughs> you know, in, in, in the nineteen eighties, uh, and I am an eighties kid. Why else would I have a picture of a ghetto blaster an hour ago? Um, yeah, in the nineteen eighties, you know, things were things were very simple. You could just buy well your seven four one or pamp was was flavor of the month. So you had an 081, I think TL081, um, if you wanted to be fancy. But you know, just you just I still think. For the next year and a half, because this supply chain issue is going to run, I, I believe now until the middle of 2023. I'm seeing dates pushed out to that. And Intel and Microchip uh, have both announced um, don't spend anything until 2023. So uh, the problem's going from bad to worse for a fact. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be looking to try and find any specialist chips anyway. I, I would encourage to. Try, try and stick with the basics. If I'm I, th I think uh, I'm not the time in any sense an expert, but my my take is that in the analog domain, those um, trade offs that uh, Stephen was mentioning earlier are such that you you really need to quite carefully tune the circuit you're doing to your particular circumstance. Uh, uh, and so a pre-packaged thing isn't really valuable because the basic components are cheap and easy. Um, and to go beyond that, you're hard coding um, the, your, your trade-offs. Yeah. Um, and, and it's the trade-offs that, you know, if you're in the audio domain or uh, you know, signal processing domain, it's those trade-offs that make your, your product unique. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what um, I would say, I mean, I've just had a very, very, very quick check on on the internet. There are some chips by Maxim and I'm sure others which take the filter a little bit further by uh, that they're, they're called switched capacitor filters. Uh, yeah. And that those offer slightly fancier uh, functionality, but they're not they're not doing the same thing. They're, they're mm -hmm. doing a different job. Yeah, in fact, I think there's something in this book on just a uh, film thinking what on earth is a switch capacitor? I think, um, I'm going to take a chance here. I think if I turn the page, we might actually find um, switch capacitors. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure they, with about a couple of pages, they, they will start to talk. I look for how well we can all see that. Boys, uh, I'm not sure how well that works. Oh, that's an integrator. So, it's a switch, switch capacitor is, is when you've got some, uh, for those who think what on earth is a switch capacitor, uh, it's a capacitor, including the title, <laughs> with some switches. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, it's not very imaginative, is it really? But um, yeah, so, so think, what was the switch capacitor? Yeah, so yeah, so I mean, I know Cypress, if you look at Cypress Semiconductor, um, some of theirs, they go so far, don't they? And, and then, and then, and then they, they, they hold back um, a little bit. Yeah. There you go. Well, I, I the other I thing I would say is that if you're looking for uh, ICs uh, as such, um, the other route to go is the digital filter um, and digital filters can, I believe, I haven't looked specifically, be bought as, you know, as single chips, um, but they're not more commonly found as part of a DSP a digital yes. processor. Yeah. So, um, so DSP, digital signal processing, for, for, for those who think, what, what on earth are these two people talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm... We're no, that's okay. Bit no, no, no it's, it's, all, it's all about filters and, you know, um, so it's all good. So, yeah, so um, the DSP, digital signal processing, um, 
that there, there are a number of filters. I, I did start a couple of years ago to try to work out um, doing a, a digital filter in an ARM chip. And uh, I can tell you, it is not trivial at all okay. to quite work it out. And my, well, a couple of things actually, I'm looking at one of my solutions here, I'll just drop under the camera in a second. One of the things I think if you're going to go digital filtering, First of all, I think you're going to struggle to do it in something like an Arduino because it just hasn't got hasn't got the uh, hasn't got the uh, the minerals to pull it off. Uh, it takes a lot of memory, a lot of processing. Um, if, even when you're you're using um, some something called a butterfly, uh, which we won't get into, but there there are bits and pieces which are done. Usually, you have to go to the ARM Cortex M4, M5 to start to think about. Um, uh, digital filtering, but I, th I think you'll probably find. I guess you found as well, Ruth. Is uh, you often find chips that are doing the digital number crunching are very much dedicated to that one and only job. Yeah, that that's why. I mean, these DSP chips are a thing, so they are very specialized computer processors yeah. that have been specialized probably more than anything else to do Fourier transforms and inverse Fourier transforms yeah of which the butterfly is the the building block it is no it happens and, to be and the way the filtering happens usually is that you digitize the signal Nyquist et al um, you then process that Fourier domain you know that that um frequency domain signal, which is essentially you get a, a, a histogram of what the signal looked like in some fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. you, you, you process that, you say, OK, right, well, we'll we'll chop it off. We'll you know, do our ideal low pass filter by just blanking everything above such a frequency. And then you reconstitute it by yep. doing the inverse transform. Yeah. Um, and then you have to do an awful lot of fiddling around because the signal doesn't quite reconstitute. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, just as we, we come to a close today, um, some, something here which is just sitting actually coincidentally, we didn't plan this, I promise, um, is this is something that I designed a little while ago. This is an analog digital hybrid for doing AI. So what, what, what I've done here, because, you know, as we were mentioning, um, to start to do digital filtering uh, takes an immense amount of processing power and, and time. And of course, if you want to try and do it in real time as well, there's another complication. So what I designed here some uh, a couple of years ago now, this is a hybrid um, analog digital computer where I've got a load of analog filtering. These are some, I've got seven active filters here. And in fact, just in here, this is creating me a negative voltage um, for my op amps. So, and then I've got an arm core here where, where the output for each of these filters goes into an arm core. So what I've then done is I've got a number of filter circuits. That's a symbol for a filter. Um, so I might have, you know, uh, F, uh, let's say one kilohertz. And then I had another filter, which were, I'm just guessing at these numbers right now, two kilohertz. Yep. F three kilohertz, just, just by way of example, this circuit does. Oops. So that's my input. And then I, then I put these into my this is actually an ARM core. It doesn't matter whether you're using ARM or with using AVR, it really doesn't matter. So, and then I did some processing that way. So a little bit of pre-processing using analog filtering. And then depending on what sort of band I got, so I was more interested in the bands rather than what the actual frequencies were, I could then work out, do a bit of number crunching and a bit of AI um, DSP on like the component bands 
by having a hybrid between analog and digital. So there is a way around it. And of course, if you're using something like, you know, the Arduino Uno, for example, the reason why you can do something like that, either with an RC filter, um, although make sure you, you do have a DC block, um, uh, DC offset, of course, you don't want to end up putting negative voltages into any of these chips. So there are, there are ways of working around the problem for sure. In fact, I, I quite like the excitement of uh, analog computing. Um, it, interestingly, um, if you if you examine the functionality of human ear and for that matter, most um, animal vibration sensors, the uh, the functionality is pretty much exactly what you've driven out, that you've drawn out, except that instead of just three, it's more like 300 or perhaps even um, 500 or 700 yeah. frequencies that are being looked at. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, fact uh, my, my, uh, my, my MSC project was actually on hearing uh, and, <laughs> and deafness as well. Um, yeah. I, I could bore you to tears about the, the human ear. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, that anyway, was, but what, that, that is ago. pretty much exactly what what the human ear does: is it splits it up analog domain, and then you get a, a signal per per band, and yeah. then it in in the frequency domain, it then looks at what's happening. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. So, exactly. So, brilliant. Okay. Well, look, it's it's eight thirty. Um, I've, I've got a couple of things. If you've got anything else that would like to uh, chuck into the mix, I will uh, just do a quick round robin to uh, highlight a few things. Anyone want to throw anything else into the mix? How do you spell Chebachev? Oh, <laughs> I think I spelled it right. Uh, C H. Um, where is it? Hang on, here we go. Uh, one moment, caller. Well, two things. A, uh, uh, you can never find anything when you want it, can you? Um, right, okay, it is C H E B Y. Uh -huh. C H E V. Chevy Chev. Okay. Thanks very yeah, much. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's my favorite filter if you've ever favorite filter. So, I will just remind you um, uh, you can actually download all these. These are available to download. So, uh, if you didn't get to download them, you can always they'll live there forever. So, you can even do it tomorrow or, or the day after. I, I don't ever take them down. So, all the slides that we've looked at, they're all available to download for free. Just, just grab them. Uh, the next one. Uh, is on Wednesday, the 2nd of February. Um, chances are it will still be online. I, I very much doubt we're going to get to be in make space, but uh, if we can, we will be in make space. Um, I suspect we won't be able to just yet. And uh, my plan is for next time, we're going to talk a little bit about AI. Oh my Lord. Um, so let's, we'll have a look at some, uh, what I would call, schoolyard mathematics if, if you remember when you did your o levels and gcse's when you're all crammed around the back of the bike shed with your math books um it, it's going to be that, that sort of level um so it'll be some simple ai um which you can apply to you know even even bang it into an arduino uno is quite capable of doing uh, what i've got planned for us to have a look at brilliant okay um it's it's just gone 8 30. Um, if anybody wants to chuck anything else in, please say so. Otherwise, it, it's time for us to all go and put the kettle on. If anyone's spoken and their microphone's not on, definitely won't be able to hear. Thank you. Oh, there we go. And there's one thing left here as well. Uh, oh, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for your time. My pleasure, my pleasure. I look forward to seeing you all, all next time. Great. Okay, then I will, I will let you all go and I will see you all soon. Thanks very Bye -bye. much. Thank you Bye. too, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Stephen, would be good to catch up sometime if you've got a sec, but whatever. Uh, yeah, 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 no, I'll hang around. I'll just, I'll just unshare the screen.